Sarah will continue answering your questions in the Q&A. And- uh, I can't turn my video on. Oh, that's a Sarah problem. I can fix that. I can fix that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, all right. So while Sarah's fixing that, um, I will start with introductions. So I'm going to be moderating. I'm Dr. Diana Louiakis. Um, I work over at the University of Connecticut, as well as Colgate Palmolive, and oh, I've just got a video working, so we're good. And uh, my main focus is astrobiology and bioinformatics, and so I can help out with some of your questions, but we're going to rely on our other panelists to do most of the question answering. And today with us, uh, we have uh, Dr. Morgan Helene. And we have Dr. Abby Stevens and uh, Dr. Helene, if you wanna introduce yourself and a little of your background, it's extensive. So I won't go through all of that. Hey everyone, hopefully you can hear me fine. Um, I'm in my car, I'm actually doing field work today. <laughs> so I'm uh, out in the field doing work right now, but um, really happy to be here, really excited to talk about Star Wars and connection with uh, biology. And I am a biologist, spanning everything from molecular biology to botany, so plant sciences, all the way up to uh, ecology. So kind of a um, <clears throat> pretty, you know, wide, um, wide scale of a uh, study of life. So great to be here. Okay, Dr. Abby Stevens, would you like yeah. to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Abby. I am an astronomer based in Michigan. Um, I have a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics and a master's in physics um, and bachelor's in mathematical physics, so I also like math a lot. Um, I study black holes and neutron stars, which are super, super cool. Um, and I like to study kind of the extreme physics in uh, really strong gravitational fields. Um, I also do some work with um, a extra telescope that is attached to the International Space Station right now. It's called NICER. They did a Reddit AMA yesterday, actually. Um, and I also do work uh, around uh, mental well-being in academia and um, mentoring students. And um, I'm on the steering committee for a proposed NASA X-ray Space Telescope. Fantastic. So we are so lucky to have both of you here today. Because these I've already come up with a few questions of my own. Um, that I've been dying to have answered for like 30 years. So um, we'll get started and I will be watching for all of the audience questions as well, um, but we'll start with some of the questions that I have. So first, I really think that we should just get this out of the way. Um, who would make a better pet, a porg or a womp rat? This is a trick question. That's a great question. So first of all, I would not advocate keeping non-domesticated animals as pets. Uh, <laughs> so just want to put that out there. Um, <laughs> and presumably if there were some porgs who were domesticated out there in the uh, Star Wars galaxy, then I would say that would make it probably a better option. They seem pretty um, you know, docile and um, friendly for the most part. Whereas womp rats are, they can be like six feet long, apparently, which is, it's not like a rat, not like a rat size. There's like, a, you know, pretty giant beast. <clears throat> so uh, I would, I would say Porg, but, um, you know, stick to the, uh, you know, Star Wars versions of, you know, maybe a dog or a cat or something. Um, there was a, it's called a Loth cat in the Star Wars universe, which I, I think are domesticated. So that might be a better option. <laughs> From a purely aesthetics point of view, I'd rather have a pork. I couldn't agree more. I do love the porgs. And interesting fact about Star Wars, the porgs were not supposed to be there at all. Uh, they just couldn't get the puffins out of the shot. And so they CGI'd over the puffins and made porgs. So they're my favorite Star Wars animal because of that. So we didn't just push them out of the way for the movie. They're like a protected species on the island they were filming on, so they like couldn't touch them. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully they wouldn't have anyway. Also but... true. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
All right, so that, all right, no questions from the audience yet. So send us your question. Oh, student question, here we go. Um, all right, so you mentioned black holes. What did you, what do you know about white holes? Have you encountered one in space? So white holes are a science fiction concept. They're not like a physical concept, um, but these are something um, that um, authors and creators have dreamed up as a way to um, like travel between two different places. So the, the um, science fiction idea of a white hole, well, first of all, for a black hole, this is something it's like, it's like a hole in space time where stuff falls in. They don't like suck things in, they, they don't have that kind of thing, but it's just like super strong gravity where if you get close enough, you like fall in and get stuck. Um, things can also orbit around black holes very stably and like they're totally fine. Um, most things aren't within like the danger zone of a black hole, they can just orbit totally fine. But so a white hole, instead of things falling in, a white hole things would come out is the idea of that. So this is not a physical concept that we have, um, but it's a really cool idea to play with in storytelling. Um, and uh, the idea of, of this would be, um, it's, it's used to kind of get around the idea of getting to really far distances without traveling faster than the speed of light is you would go into a black hole and come out of a white hole. Um, don't try that. We've never put anything into a black hole. They're too far away. Um, it, it won't survive. Don't do that. Okay, so we have some follow up black hole questions. Okay. Um, one from Sherry, have you ever seen a black hole? And Megan wants to know how are black holes made? And so these might be some great questions. Um, so this is exactly what I study. Um, there are so we, we have seen many different black holes. Um, uh, there's two different types of black holes uh, based on their size. The smaller black holes are formed when you have a massive star that's like 20 times as big as our sun or even bigger. Um, at the end of its life, it's burned through all of its fuel. And it turns out massive stars, like really, really big ones, um, uh, die sooner. They burn through all of their fuel a lot faster and hotter. And so they have much shorter lives. At the end of their life, when they burn through all of their fuel, they go into this really big supernova explosion. Um, and at the end, and inside, at the, the, like the, the remnant that's left over after the supernova, um, has all collapsed under its intense gravity, and this is a black hole. Um, so it it's this weird, um, almost like mathematical concept um, where uh, physics just gets really, really extreme around them. Like you can you can test things around black holes that you can't test anywhere else in the universe. Um, and so then this is the small black holes. The much bigger black holes are the same kind of thing in the middle, but how they're formed is quite different. So these ones are at the centers of galaxies. We call these supermassive black holes because they're really big and physicists are super creative. Um, and we have one at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Our supermassive black hole is called Sagittarius A star. Um, and they're the centers of pretty much all the galaxies that we've seen. Um, and these ones are millions of times the mass of our sun up to billions of times the mass of our sun, so super big. Um, we don't entirely know how they were formed. We think that they, they've been around since super early in the universe. So um, it's possible that it could be like a bunch of the small black holes have like globbed on together and like mashed together to make a big one, but it would take a super long time for that to happen. And we don't see any like, intermediate black holes. It's like if you had a population of people that you had seen for the first time, tons and tons of kids, tons and tons of grown-ups, and like two teenagers. You wouldn't necessarily think that kids grow up to become adults if you only ever seen two teenagers and there's like billions of kids and billions of adults. So we've only seen a couple teenage black holes in this sense. So we don't know if the small ones become the big ones or if they are two different um, types of black holes that are made in different ways. Um, yes, I've seen them. Um, I've seen a bunch of them. Um, we can't actually see the black hole itself because um, nothing can escape from inside of it. That's what makes it black or dark to us. Light can't escape, but we can see stuff around the black hole. Um, so a lot of them are eating stars. This is, this is the type that I study. Um, I actually did a Skype a Scientist um, presentation that's on the YouTube channel a month ago or so. 
um, and I meet with lots of school classes to talk about how we can see black holes. Um, they're, they're mean zombie friends that eat their friends' stars and um, kind of light up a whole bunch. And we see the light coming from the stuff around the black hole. We also see them when they smash together and shine gravitational waves instead of light. And this is what the LIGO and Virgo detectors are doing to see gravitational waves. We have a, we have a couple other ways as well, but this is how we can see black holes. Okay, so we have a lot of interest in black holes and to bring it back to Star Wars. Yeah. Are we anywhere near shortening the Kessel Run ourselves using black hole clusters? And is that even a thing? <laughs> yeah, so um, I did only preliminary research. I couldn't find like a plot for the Kessel Run um, of like where in the galaxy or you know a hypothetical galaxy it supposedly is. Um, a parsec is the unit that they're using and um, Canon has, so, so parsec is a unit of distance, it's not a unit of time. Um, and one parsec is the distance between us and our nearest star, which is about 4.2 light years away. Um, light year is the distance that if you were to shine a flashlight and it were to go on forever, it's the distance it would travel in a whole year. It's very far. Um, we use light years and parsecs to measure distances in space, especially outside of our solar system, just because things are really big and really far. Um, within the galaxy, instead of using parsecs, we use kiloparsecs, so thousands of parsecs. And to measure distances to far away galaxies, we use megaparsecs or millions of parsecs. So using a parsec as your unit of measurement is like our nearby stellar neighborhood. Um, and so the kind of canon interpretation is that um, Han Solo um, uh, uh, shortened his route and that's how he did it in 12 parsecs. Um, so, uh, and of course Han Solo would like find a shortcut and shorten his route. Um, so black hole clusters, it would need to be a cluster of stellar mass black holes because those are small, like a stellar mass black hole, oh, I'm showing it in my hands, it's not that small. It's um, it's like a few kilometers, it's like maybe 20, so like, um, I don't know, like, like 10 to 20 miles, 20 to 40 kilometers across. Um, so it's like the size of a small city, um, as opposed to things that are like bigger than the solar system. Um, and so you would have to get a cluster of stellar mass black holes that are really close together. And I guess you could have that. We have these parts of our galaxy called globular clusters. And this is where um, just stuff's super close together. Um, and there's a lot more of what we call dynamical interaction, like stuff zooming around each other. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of empty space in our galaxy. So you have to have a cluster of black holes um, uh, nearby, like in a globular cluster. Um, you could, so outside of that, you could have, like you could be using the black hole for like a gravitational assist to like kind of slingshot you around. We use gravitational assists um, quite a bit when we're navigating the solar system. Um, we can slingshot stuff around Mars and around the moon and around Venus. Um, or Jupiter and the moon, like we've, we've definitely done this. This is like a technique that is great to kind of shorten your fuel usage and use the gravity of the planet to help you along your way. So um, what I'm hearing is yeah. that maybe someone in this audience will be the one to beat Han Solo's. Yeah, totally, over. totally. If it's you had possible. a cluster of supermassive black holes, it'd be bigger than 12 parsecs. So I, I, I wouldn't go for that, but yeah, right. stellar mass black holes, totally. Okay, so let's shift back over to uh, to our biology and talk about the planets. So we have got quite a few questions about planets, um, including whether or not the islands in Star Wars Star Wars are real, and how likely is it that there is an Earth-like planet and or humanoid aliens like we see in Star Wars. I will remind everybody that we do know because Padme did outright say it, that they are humans. So we're probably descendants of those characters. So Morgan, do you have some biodiversity answers? Those are really great, great questions. So the first one um, mentioned uh, about, are the islands real? And yeah, as Diana and Abby mentioned, um, there was, uh, you know, they, were filming on these islands for Last Jedi with like the, you know, the porgs were actually the puffins that were on these islands. It was like Skellig something in um, off the coast of uh, the British Isles, I believe, is where that was. I think um, so. They're definitely based on um, kind of those real islands for inspiration. But like you know that planet was called Octu, Octu so it was like a 
they you know change it for the Star Wars universe and everything and that's a good question about like you know humans in the Star Wars universe so they're definitely uh you know, they're they're called humans um what what there's kind of a question open question of whether they're exactly the same as we are or I'm I'm kind of thinking that there was there might be like some convergent evolution or something so humans uh, you know started simultaneously uh, you know in other parts of the galaxy and then um evolved to look similar um that's that's kind of what I'm thinking but you know still on earth they would be considered alien you know alien still so You're Sorry. Go ahead. So yeah, uh, convergent evolution, that's basically, um, you know, in two different areas, uh, uh, spatially separate areas, a species evolving to look similar, but not being directly descended from each one another, so. All right, great answers. And so our next question, is about Darth Vader. Uh, we want to know why he has such strangled breathing pattern and does his suit breathe for him? So this is a great combination of engineering and biology questions. That's another great question. I actually, so uh, Darth Vader, he gets his injuries on uh, when he's has a battle with Obi-Wan on Mustafar, this like very uh, kind of a lava planet, I would say. And, you know, he's, he looks like he's very close to dying. He's like burnt up and everything. Um, I don't know exactly what his exact injuries are. You know, he does have that kind of uh, mechanical breathing sound, you know, the iconic Darth Vader um, uh, suit sound that you hear in the original trilogy. I I don't know for sure. There there is at least like one scene where he's um you know kind of in his own room and he doesn't ha doesn't have the helmet on or anything. Um you, you know kind of see some of his injuries and things. I don't know if the suit is actually um you know breathing for him or if it's like you know an assisted thing or what the extent of extent of it is. Um I would say that one piece of evidence pointing to the suit, um, you know, being kind of like a, um, you know, assisted breathing machine is that in episode six, so Return of the Jedi, when Palpatine uses his lightning and then it seems to kind of disable his suit a little bit and then uh, he later dies that way. So that, that's one piece of evidence, but um, I don't know if exactly for sure. Uh, I don't know uh, what you think, Abby, if you've um, read about this a bit more, but. Yeah, so I haven't read about it, and I'm like, no medical training whatsoever, just an astronomer with ideas. <laughs> um, so I almost imagine it, like, unfortunately, we've learned a lot about ventilators um, the past year or so, and those um, are, in my non-medical understanding, a combination of, like, assisted, it's, it's like a very assisted breathing thing. Um, and so I'm imagining Darth Vader's suit as being like a like multi-step down the line personal portable ventilator um, in some sense. That's how I imagine it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that episode three scene is the hardest one to watch, I think, in that trilogy. And there's no doubt in my mind that Anakin Skywalker suffered from some serious burning in his lungs. And oh, yeah would as require as well yeah absolutely um so great question and another darth vader question did science fiction play any factor oh no this isn't a darth vader question uh just a general question to both of you did science fiction play any factor in becoming uh in you becoming such a formidable person of science I like the idea of formidable person of science. This might be my new Twitter bio. Um, <laughs> so I had a really roundabout way of getting into science. Um, I, I, so Star Wars was a part of it. Um, 
I um, was a child of the 80s and 90s and um, the like remastered VHSs came out and my parents um, remembered going to see the movies in the theaters when the original trilogy when they first came out and so um, I'm the oldest so they were like okay Abby it's your like you get to watch this now and I remember I got to watch it after my siblings had gone to bed and it was so special and fun I remember having nightmares forever after episode five when Han Solo gets frozen like I, I don't know how old I was um, this, but I was definitely in elementary school and they were like you're old enough for this and I was like I want to be but I'm so scared um, and then once my siblings were old enough to watch it um, uh, the, the three Star Wars movies were like the only ones that all three of us could agree on um, so that's what we watched all the time um, and we watched Return of the Jedi the, the most often um, and we got really good we being children we were uninterested in the character development of um, like Luke and Vader and the Emperor so we got really good at fast forwarding on the VHS machine the exact amount of time needed to skip past those scenes unfortunately I now have great respect for them um, as an adult um yeah so so lots of star wars growing up um i came to and then you know there's many other star wars things that i came to much later in life um that i love very much i was accused of liking star trek at one point when i was a phd student and i realized i hadn't ever really seen star trek so i watched a lot of it like i watched all of uh, next generation and deep space nine and voyager and i was like i love this um so that was true but that was well after i was in grad school um so I started off in like theater and, and acting, got in and then switched to physics and math in my bachelor's. Um, I really like both of those things. So art yeah. and science have a way of overlapping. Art and science, absolutely. Star Trek definitely brought me into science because I wanted to study all the plants that were off world. Oh. And it wasn't until much later that I realized there are no plants off world yet <laughs> that we know of. So. Yeah. Uh, it was tough becoming an astrobiologist, knowing that ours is the only. Morgan, how about you? <laughs> yeah, how much sci-fi influenced your career? That's a really uh, great question, and that's awesome to hear, Abby and uh, Deanna, your stories about that. So actually, I also, uh, when I was in undergrad, I was actually a literature major, so um, my thesis was actually on Blade Runner, the movie Blade Runner, and that was adapted on a book, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by uh, Philip K. Dick. And so kind of uh, how do the, you know, what are the limits of adaptation? How far can you adapt something before it becomes like its own original piece of work basically? And so that was definitely uh, kind of a transition point to becoming a scientist, I would say, kind of going into these sci-fi worlds and then um, uh, connecting them with our the world that we live in and the natural world around us and everything. And I remember we um, had this science club in high school. And then one thing that event that I organized was like uh, with my friends was this um, Star Wars marathon where we just like watched all, there were only six movies at that, you know, that time. I uh, just did a marathon of all the movies and then kind of had like a running commentary about like, oh, should there be sound in space? And like, what's this creature? Could it live in this habitat, you know, on this planet and everything. So it, it was really, uh, I think, you know, definitely that inspired my uh, transition into actual science, I would say. Okay, great answers. Yeah. Um, Sci-fi, I think, is probably a lot of people's ways of getting into non-fictional science. Absolutely. Uh, so a Tatooine question. So we know Tatooine has two sons. Um, we know that that's a close binary system, which is interesting in real life. And so the question is, is it possible to have two sons on a planet like Tatooine or would that burn something up? And I think, you know, Tatooine's a pretty hot and dusty planet in the first place. So let's address this one. Uh, a little quickly so we can get some more questions going. Yeah, I'll start with the um, astronomy and astrophysics of that. So um, we definitely have seen um, systems of, so we call them exoplanets, planets that are around other stars in their own solar systems. We definitely have seen exoplanet systems in our galaxy that have two stars at the middle and then have planets around the outside of them. Um, I think like Kepler, a, a lot of them start with the name Kepler. I think Kepler 16b is one of them. Um, and so these are um, 
um, we, we tend to find planets that are really close to their host stars, so ho close to their own suns, um, just because they're easier to detect right now. Um, and we, there are uh, rocky or terrestrial planets that are around binary stars. Um, so a planet like Tatooine has lots of sand. And so this means, so sand is typically made of silicon. It has a lot of silicon in it. So um, there's lots of silicon in our rocks. So it's quite plausible that, that you could have like a, an exoplanet around a binary star system that has a high silicate content. So you would have lots of, um, of sand. And then if it's close, if it's a bit closer to its suns than we are to our sun, then um, it'd be hotter. Um, and having like wind patterns to like blow everything all around, like that's not unique to Earth. We see that in other planets in our solar system and other exoplanets and stuff. So totally plausible. Okay, Morgan, do you want to comment on the Tatooine biodiversity and feel free to bring in some of the more pleasant planets, Naboo and uh, some of our more biodiverse hubs? <laughs> that's, that's a great uh, question. Sorry, I won't comment on the um, star system. The, yeah, star system, uh, the side of it, but I, you know, I'm interested in the, how does Tatooine get its breathable atmosphere because we don't see a lot of plants on Tatooine. And, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, assuming that the humans there are also oxygen breathing life forms, you don't see a lot of like photosynthetic life on Tatooine. So that's a good question. Like how does it get its um, breathable atmosphere? What's the composition of the atmosphere? Um, so in the world of Star Wars, there are a lot of planets that have kind of one kind of overall type of climate. Like, you know, Tatooine's just like this, you know, and then um, Naboo, for example, is seems kind of like a Mediterranean climate to me, um, you know, kind of inspired by Italian or uh, coastal California environments, I would say. So, um, and there's another, probably one of my favorite planets is uh, Felucia. It was seen in Revenge of the Sith for a little bit. And there's just all these different, seem like probably fungi or you know, similar life forms to fungi um, that are growing as, you know, big as trees are basically. And a lot of, um, you know, plants that seem kind of like pitcher plants or like Venus flytraps. And a lot of these carnivorous plants are growing in like nutrient poor soil. So they uh, are carnivorous to, you know, get additional things that the soil can't provide them. So um, yeah, it's, I think Felucia is like my favorite planet, but there's a lot of I'd like to, you know, explore, uh, you know, Naboo and all the other ones also, so. Yeah, I, I could agree with that. And that was actually one of the other questions was what is your favorite planet? And mine is a cheat because I want to go where the Ewoks are and that's, that's technically a moon, right? I was just going to say that I like Endor. It's an exo moon. So it's a moon around an exoplanet. Um, but like we know, for example, that some of the moons around Saturn um, in our own solar system are really cool and complex. They wouldn't support life because they're quite far away and cold and dark. Um, but it's quite plausible. I mean, a planet having moons is not rare. Um, and so it it's quite plausible that you could have a really neat, um, uh, yeah, a, a really neat exomoon. Um, and that's where I'd want to be. Yeah, absolutely. To play in the forest with Ewoks. Like, what more could you want? I, mean, I don't see why that's not on the top of everyone's list of things to do. Exactly. Uh, so let's, we'll briefly switch over to some of the weapon tech, right? So we've got a lot of, a lot of weaponry in Star Wars. And of course, the most ideal weapon is the lightsaber. So the question is, has laser technology come far enough that something like lightsabers could exist and be used? And so just the idea of lasers in Star Wars is a heated debate, heated topic, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I should also say, um, I have some lightsaber. They're actually chopsticks. There's two of them, which is why they come to a taper. Um, my husband knows me very well. Um, so the the thing is, if you were to have like a laser, like we have like laser pointers and stuff. Um, if you were to have that, you can shoot the beam out just fine. 
And we have lasers that are really powerful and used for cutting things like in um, you can have these like industrial like laser printers where you have like metal like sheets of metal and then the laser can like very carefully cut things out they're really cool to watch on YouTube. Um, so we have lasers and we have um, uh, like lasers that can cut stuff. The hardest part for me is that it ends. So a laser keeps going until it bounces off of something or is absorbed by something. That's how light works. Cause a laser is just a type of light where, where all of the little light waves are in phase together, hanging out at the same color. Um, so so it, th having the end to it is the part that I get stuck on. Um, because we know that like when you like turn off your lightsaber you just have this little bit and it could go in your pocket. Um, and there doesn't really seem to be any kind of like, like an outer casing that expands along with it. Um, um, you know, that doesn't seem to exist. It is just light that comes out. So if you were to make a real lightsaber, you would have to have an outer casing and with an end point that reflects the laser back. Um, which would then make it really fragile because then that outer casing to be transparent would have to have like glass or something. But then like you're breaking glass and then once you've broken the glass in the middle, then you don't have an endpoint and then it just is a laser into space. So my plan, I've been trying to build a lightsaber for a while now. <laughs> and my plan was that you would have to have a rod shoot out from the center with a mirror on the end to reflect yeah. the laser back. And so yeah, you that, still that get that it. laser beam. And that leads us to another bio question. If you were to get, you know, nicked with a lightsaber, is that wound going to cauterize or are you going to bleed? That's an excellent question. And there are actually conflicting things in the movies because in episode four, uh, A New Hope, when Obi-Wan cuts off the arm of uh, one of the uh, cantina, one of the characters in the cantina, there seems to be blood there, but I think that canonically now it's um, just instantly cauterizing the wound. So there's no blood that's going to be lost from that wound anymore. Um, and I think also like in the cantina, like that's an alien life form, like it's not a human or humanoid. And so like maybe they have different body temperatures and it wouldn't cauterize in the same way that like a human body would. Really good point. Yeah. And I think in, uh, in the new trilogies, there's also a scene where one of the stormtroopers is bleeding. And oh, back. yeah. So a wrench into things. And uh, another question that um, this is actually mine, and I just wanted to bring it up that not everything in Star Wars is lasers. And so if we think about our blasters, uh, these are particle beams. And my question is, what does that even mean? And can we have these? So, um, yeah, so, so this is about like accelerating small packets of subatomic particles. And we have a way to do this on Earth, but it's with particle accelerators. And these are very large and very expensive to run and take many people to operate and like, you know, take up a gymnasium at its smallest, like a large gymnasium at its smallest, or like we have CERN, which like goes around like in between different countries. It's so big. Um, so I don't, I don't know how, how fast you'd have to accelerate it to like, like to shoot, like to, to damage something with the output. But this implies that we have found a way to create technology where you have, um, like everybody has like a tiny particle accelerator in their pocket. Um, which is really cool. Um, and I don't know exactly how they would like, I guess you just like start and stop the beam really fast. So you'd have like a, like a windowing mechanism on your particle beam, um, which we can do. I mean, we do windowing mechanisms with like lasers and stuff right now. So, so by windowing mechanism, I mean like it turns on and off at discrete times so that you have like a burst. Um, but yeah, this implies that everybody's got particle accelerators in their pockets, which is pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to take that as maybe I'll have a blaster at some point. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so we do have, we have so many questions. So let's uh, go with uh, a quick fire question. What, and this is also a loaded question. What is your favorite Star Wars? 
movie or otherwise. Throw that in there. I don't know. I'll say Empire Strikes Back. It's a lot of, I think like it's a popular favorite, but um, it still holds up for me, so. Yeah, I'd say Return of the Jedi, just because of my um, childhood associations with it. Great story, Ewoks, good ending, good battle scenes and like multiple battle scenes with like cuts between them. Yeah, Return of the Jedi. Both really great answers. My That's answer yours. is super controversial. And the answer is Rogue One. Oh, that's a good one. I just, I've only seen it once. So I don't have the like. I have seen it more than once. Emotional ties. <laughs> I'm not going to say how many times. <laughs> uh, okay. So our Wookiees, Colby grade four asks, are Wookiees based on an animal? And if so, what animal? Oops, sorry. My phone is muted. Um, I'm thinking, you know, they do seem um, kind of like a great ape, you know, humanoid, uh, tall, furry, very furry and everything. Um, I, I don't, there's not a specific like one-to-one -one in our world. Um, almost seems like a type of like cryptozoology, like a Sasquatch or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would say the closest thing, closest analogy would be like a great ape, I would say. Okay, so if if we're going primate, then they are probably sweaters. They would cool off by sweating because we see we see Chewy on Tatooine and he's not panting, right? He's not really sweating either, right? You don't see him wet. Always wondered how Chewy would cool off. The not wet sweating might have been a more artistic choice. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It is Hollywood. <laughs> Uh, okay, so do you think there's other intelligent life in another universe, and why? So uh, the idea of another universe, I'm going to just sidestep, but to say elsewhere in our universe, in like a different galaxy, um, I think that at some point during the entire time existence of the universe, it is likely that there will be life elsewhere on some planet somewhere else in the universe. Uh, one of the primary things that we hold dear in physics is that like nothing about our personal circumstances, like our, our physical circumstances here is unique. That these, um, that the, the, the laws that govern what happens to us and how things work here hold true everywhere else. So um, though it takes a lot of chance and this is, quickly diving into Morgan's territory, it takes a lot of probability, like small probabilities to have intelligent, like to have, you know, bacterial life arise, let alone intelligent life, like a humanoid. Um, I do think that it's at some point in the entire history of the entire universe, both prior and in the future, there will be some kind of life elsewhere. Um, whether or not it's intelligent, I don't know. And I really don't think that our timelines will coincide because if we've only been able to detect signals from outer space in since like the 1920s. And so this is like a hundred years, which if you look at, you know, the four and a half billion years that our sun has been around and the four billion years or so that the earth has been around, a hundred years is like, this like the tiniest blip. So having our tiny blip coincide with their tiny blip, I think is, is improbable. But somewhere, somehow, yeah. Unless we can get that that Kessel Run speed down, then we can get Unless out. we get that down, yeah. I totally agree with Abby. Um, that's what I'm thinking, you know, also. Um, and, you know, even today we're getting, like there was a signature um, on Venus of phosphine apparently, which is product of microbes. So I'm not sure, you know, we'll see how well that data holds up, but, um, yeah, you know, in terms of intelligent life, we don't don't have solid data yet. But um, yeah, given vast amount of time and the vastness of the universe, then yeah, I agree with Abby that um, yeah, you know, at some point, if not now, then they would be out there. So, all right. And so we have another question, a bio question. What is the uh, main or biggest connection? between Star Wars and biology, 
And to that, I also want to add, because this links to the conversation we're having right now about the evolution of microbes. I don't think we can talk about the evolution of microbes and intelligent life without noting that midichlorians are tiny intelligent life forms. So not all intelligent life has to be as big as us, right? Doesn't have to be, we haven't seen it. But Morgan, you have some comments on the biology and Star Wars connections. That's a great question. And I would say that biology is just, you know, such at the heart of Star Wars lore. Like, you know, the force is based in these, as Dinah said about the, you know, based, uh, conferred by these symbiotic life forms, uh, the midichlorians and everything, um, you know, all the way to, um, you know, the diversity of life that's on all the different planets that are, you know, in the Star Wars uh, universe. Um, so I would say that, you know, it covers the whole spectrum from, you know, within the cells of every living organism in Star Wars, all the way to the, a big planet-wide, um, uh, ecologies of the different planets and I would also say that it's Yoda says you know the force that um you know surrounds us binds us you know brings us together and everything so it it uses biology as a way to um you know even though you're this species on this planet or this species on this planet you know we're all connected through the same the same basic biology so yeah, great answer. Um, and I've got some, while we're on the force, some follow-up force questions. So one of them is, does Luke Skywalker inherit Darth Vader's powers? In other words, is the force heritable? And another, when a Jedi dies, why do they disappear? And so I think these are also force-related, force-adjacent questions, right? Yeah, I've got I've got mixed feelings on the midichlorian thing because it implies that you must have this heritable characteristic to be to channel the force and instead of like, you know, being a person of strong enough will and character that you can that, that you've proven yourself worthy of the force that goes out the window if you only if you adhere only to midichlorians one thing we've learned in physics is that when we have a choice a and choice b it tends to be a combination of the two so i would conjecture that in the star wars universe there's a, a combination of midichlorians conferring force powers and um just becoming the person who proves yourself worthy of, of being able to use the force. Um, so, so Luke would inherit from Darth Vader, but also he's proven himself to be a pretty stand-up guy. So um, that combination makes him really good at the force. We have to remember too though, and Morgan, you'll probably touch on this, but that they, we also have the force in the dark side. So you don't have to totally. be a stand up person. No, you don't you don't have to be a good person, but you have to be a like strong and willful and yeah. If if there's a way to have to be a stand up person without conferring goodness to that somehow. Yeah. I believe in episode 2 it was stated that the force does lie in all of us. We all have a little bit of midichlorians in us. It's just the concentration is high and Anakin Skywalker we know was off the charts for for his numbers which could have been a heritable thing for Luke right so I agree with Abby I gave a really great description on um you know midichlorians and heritability and things like that and you know the kind of that aspect of it and um I was thinking about the Jedi like disappearing after you know when they die and I think that that was a lot of it's not explained that well in the in the universe but I know that like Qui-Gon Jinn was the like might have been the first Jedi who learned that ability to become one with the force and then taught it to like Yoda and Obi-Wan and from that point on I might be wrong on that I need to double check you know double check my fact on that but I think it was a learned a learned ability that Qui Gon through like a lot a lot of training I think learned that ability. So, and I'm I'm sure once this is uploaded to YouTube, 
someone will correct you if you're wrong. <laughs> the truth of the internet is you will be corrected even will be if you weren't wrong. <laughs> okay, so this is a question. I love this question. So how would the underwater breathing systems work in the Phantom Menace? I think more than any of the space travel devices or the weaponry, that's the that's the Star Wars tech I want is that very tiny breathe underwater device that lets them walk to the underwater city. So what do you know about that? Is it possible? How is that working? So Star Wars is not the only um, universe to have um, like tiny breathing apparatuses um, uh, for, for underwater breathing. Like I, th I think I remember seeing things like this in one of the James Bond movies that's come out recently. Um, and so having some kind of like personal pocketable scuba equipment is, is a human dream, right? I mean, we, we want to fly and we want to breathe underwater. Um, so um, I, don't know, I, I don't know enough about scuba technology to know how they are doing that. It, there seems to be some mechanism because they don't have oxygen tanks with them. So there's some mechanism where they are taking the oxygen in the water and it's like an artificial fish gill where it is it is extracting the oxygen in real time and then giving you the oxygen gas for your lungs. Um, I don't know how that works on like a chemical level, but that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. Morgan, maybe your biology or, yeah. insight on how how fish even do this. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, like, you know, the fish analogy is great. You know, the gills, the water, you know, passing over the gills and everything. Um, it would have to be something like that because you don't have any sort of, um, you know, directly getting oxygen from that, from the water and then um, getting it that way. Um, I think, yeah, we should look towards, uh, you know, look for, look at fish to inform um, the possibility of designing, you know, this sort of, uh, device. Yes, hopefully someone's working on that as we speak. Um, okay, so we're about to wrap up. Uh, I wanted to ask one more combo biophysics question regarding the clones. So the question that came in is, are the clones really the clone clones? And then a follow up to that, if you were going to make a clone army, what what would you use as the skill? Would you use Jenga Fett? Or would there be some better options out there? There's a lot of science lore about the clones in, in these movies. So the first question, are all of the clones clones? And um, based on what we know from episode two, I would say that yes, they would be no, all clones of Jango Fett, the bounty hunter. Um, I know that there was some misconception about the stormtroopers being clones, and I think that those are a mix of clones, but also some enlisted uh, people also. And oh, I, that's a tough question. The starting like starting material for um, a clone, I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be in the position to choose like or to even like make a clone army it seems like that's seems like not a good not a good idea unless I, yeah I don't, I don't I'm not a fan of that idea to begin with so I'll uh refrain from from that uh choosing a starting uh yeah so um in my limited understanding when you're creating a clone you're create like you're making the DNA to then make like the the embryo, but like you then have to grow it. Like when you make a clone, you don't have an adult walk out of the thing, like out of your machine. Um, you have like a fetus that you need to like gestate, and then it's a child and it has to grow up. So like they must have like giant like baby clone army barracks somewhere to raise these giant armies that they have, um, and also like again, limited understanding, um, Morgan, please correct me. Um, when you're creating copies of DNA like this, you're gonna get errors. And so you're gonna get some like weird stuff happening in your clones. So you might like the number that you produce is not gonna be the number of like fit army soldiers you end up with. 
Um, so there's there's there are technical limitations in addition to like the significant ethics considerations going into all of this. Um, I I like Boba Fett a lot, and you can I have a plushie in the back. Um, Jango Fett is also great because, but like, was he really so great that you're going to make an entire army based on him? Like I that part surprised me. I'll I'll be honest. Um, you know, good soldier and all that, but like a whole army. Hmm. Um, yeah, that that's where I stand. Yeah, I think I'd I'd even push back against that good soldier because he was a bounty hunter. Oh, that's true. He's yeah. a bit erratic to me. I, I just meant he's he's got like a, like yeah. a, a wide skill set, but like the skill set isn't heritable. He's got like the physical characteristics that would that would give you the ability to do those. Th- yeah, yeah, like him. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of, if, if any of you are interested in more clone information, just one Google search, you don't even have to leave the first page and you will be completely overwhelmed with clone information. Um, yeah. We do know later, I don't know which, which is more unethical, making clones or the later ideas that we learn in the new trilogies that they may be actually just a, obtaining children and grow oh. up into stormtroopers. Yeah, I mean- so, not great either, right? But also, like, we don't we don't look to um, we're not looking to them for like moral guidance. Like, I don't think anyone's making the mistake of like considering them to be ethical people. So, I'm unsurprised that they're doing terrible things. Yeah, and we know that clones were made to follow orders, and so yeah, that's what they do, and they do seem to do a good job of following orders, clones and stormtroopers, other than Finn. Finn did not follow orders. And right, which is love him for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, it's getting close to two o'clock. So I think we can wrap this up. Do you each want to give any outgoing words about Star Wars and your love of Star Wars and and where we can find you on social media? Where we can find you on social media? <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, one of the things I've been getting into lately is uh, science consulting and advising for creative projects. And so talking about things like science of Star Wars is completely my jam. Um, so I'd love to have more opportunities to do that. Um, I, you can find me on Twitter at Abigail Stev. It's like a long first name, short last name. I thought it was cute, but then I can't change it now. So um, that's me on Twitter. Um, I also have a website, abigailstevens.com. Um, I'm based in Michigan in the Midwest. Um, and Black holes are really cool. I'm glad that they show up in the Star Wars universe. This was so much fun. So I forgot to mention, so uh, I'm based in New York City. So my um, Twitter is uh, the Morgan Trail, like the Oregon Trail, but with Morgan there. And uh, website, Morgan, H-A-L-A-N-E dot com, first name, last name dot com. And it's like, sounds cliche, but you know, Star Wars, like, really makes me feel like a kid again in a lot of ways whenever I watch it. Um, First episode I watched was episode one when I was a little kid back in 1999, and, you know, like, all of the trade dispute stuff, like, went over my head, but, you know, I just, like, enjoyed the ride, like, the lightsaber fights and the cool different species and everything, so um, that's kind of, you know, still has stuck with me now, so... It's always interesting to find someone who did not start on four. So it's different perspective, really different perspective. But yeah, Star Wars is absolutely one of my top five sci-fis. And um, you can find me at Diana, D-Y-A-N-N-A 27 on Twitter. And um, that will take you to any other social medias of mine. Um, feel free to send me your Star Wars questions any anytime. Uh, and I will let Sarah wrap this up. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for coming. We think this was super cool. Also, I'm, I'm fostering a kitten. And so this whole time, there's been a kitten like attacking me. Um, so this kitten is up for adoption in Philadelphia. And you only um, turned on the video now? I just wanted it to be all Star, star Wars all the time today. <laughs> I don't know much about Star Wars, so I wanted to make sure the Star Wars people got 
their day. Um, but anyway, uh, so we'll be releasing more of uh, our live streams next week. Um, if you would like to see any particular topic um, covered in Skype a Scientist Live, please just email us at skypeascientist.com or skypeascientist at gmail.com. Um, also our website is skypeascientist.com. Thank you all for, uh, for covering this for us. I, it, this was super fun and I really appreciate uh, your time and expertise in uh, Star Wars. Um, and Erin, thank you for light speed translation. Amazing as always with all the technical, uh, it, you impress me every single time we do one of these sessions. Um, all right, thank you for everyone for coming. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.